uh, zero out of one in the European Space Agency. They're one for two. Next, please. The part of our communication system uh, involved with communicating back to Earth from Mars is the Deep Space Network. Uh, there's three locations of Deep Space Network, Goldstone, California, Madrid, Spain, and Canberra, Australia. The reason we have these are roughly 120 degrees apart on the globe. So at any one given instant in time, at least one of the ground stations is observing Mars directly. Next. How do we communicate? Up to, Phoenix changed things a little bit, but up into the past, up until then, if you have a rover sitting on Mars, it's got two options for communications. You can either go directly to Earth using an X-band and using very slow uh, data rates similar to dial-up, or you can communicate to an orbiter using our UHF uh, radios at rates that are roughly uh, around early days of uh, cable modem data rates, and that in turn, it gets stored, the data gets stored on the orbiter, which communicates back to Earth with a more powerful X-band transmitter and has a larger antenna. And it's, the data rate there is roughly equivalent to DSL. Uh, one of the interesting side facts is on the Mars rovers, originally it was intended that the X-band was going to communicate, X-band is close to sa uh, satellite home TV was going to communicate directly to Earth, but we had a mission where we uh, doing a UHF relay, dumped the entire memory from the rover into the satellite in less than one pass, and they said, okay, we're not gonna use brand X, uh, X band anymore, I'm not gonna mention their name, and uh, decided to rely on our, our units instead. Next, please. Phoenix Landing. Uh, Phoenix changed the game plan on communications because at Phoenix they decided, okay, we're scrapping the X-band entirely and we're going to go with two UHF radios, one serving as backup to the next. There were two monitorings going on during the Phoenix mission. One was the Deep Space Network through the Mars Orbiters, MRO, Odyssey, and the European Space Agency's uh, Mars Express. They were getting highly detailed information. I was at, uh, I was fortunate enough to be at Green Bank, West Virginia. We were monitoring as a backup plan in case something happened with the uh, orbiters. And we were monitoring just the carrier frequency of the UHF radio, even with the world's largest steerable radio antenna. All we could do is pick up just a single one hertz frequency. And we were looking at uh, Doppler shift, and Doppler is you're blowing a horn and you're coming towards somebody, it sounds high pitched, you go away, it sounds low pitched. Well, we were monitoring what was happening by the Doppler frequency, it was real high pitched going into the atmosphere, the hits the atmosphere, it starts getting lower and lower in frequency, bang, the parachute opens, it goes, it's a big jump, and then it lands on the planet, Doppler goes away. Uh, the contingency built in was one minute, if everything was okay, one minute after landing, the carrier shut down to the next orbital pass and everything went quite, quite went just like that. So everyone was very relieved. Next, please. Now, even 40 years before the invention of radio, Cincinnati, Ohio, was very instrumental in Mars exploration. At the Cincinnati Observatory Center, which I am a member of, <laughs> the middle telescope, the mers mailer Telescope, the Ormsby Mitchell, discovered what was called the Mitchell Mountains on, on Mars. They were, how convenient, but they were named after him, actually. Yeah. We have down at the observatory, we, it's a public outreach education on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturday nights. We have public programs. The ones on Thursdays are free. Next. <coughs> the uh, original location for the observatory is now a uh, monastery slash uh, cathedral at Mount Adams. It was located just overlooking the Ohio River in 1870. The light pollution became so bad that we had to move it out to Mount Lookout, which is <coughs> where the two buildings are located. The building on the far right-hand side, that houses the mers mailer Telescope, which is still in use today, which is where they discovered the Mitchell Mountains of Mars. And we have 
over there the Herget building, which is the new telescope and which we acquired in 1904. Next. Now on to our stuff. In roughly 98, uh, we got involved in the Mars missions with the uh, Mars 1998 orbiter, the Mars uh, MT, uh, my name, it's escaped, Mars Global Surveyor. That was our 502 radio. It uh, transmitted on uh, one channel, received on another channel. It uh, was actually utilized in when they did the Pathfinder missions. The interest, the give you an idea of the uh, of the uh, photographic capability is there's the infamous or famous notorious face on Mars in the uh, lower right hand picture. Next, please. We come to Mars 2001. The uh, it is basically the 502 radio with improvements in the software. The capability as far as transmit power and receive power are about the same, but they installed some international protocols inside the uh, inside the elect the digital electronics, which allowed uh, communication with uh, spacecraft from other uh, other nations. It carried an infrared camera. The picture you see on the far right is an infrared picture taken of a point of a geographical uh, event on Mars. Next. We come up to now, spared an opportunity in uh, 2003. This was the same radio that exists upon the Odyssey orbiter but it is a, uh, the channels are reversed. The, it receives on the same channel that the Odyssey transmits and that the Odyssey receives on the channel that the, uh, that the uh, lander transmits. Next. Now pardon me while I get my far-sighted glasses on. The, uh, what we're seeing here, our instruments carried on the, uh, <coughs> on, on the landers or on the rovers. The, uh, the mini test is utilized to pick out interesting rock formations that require a, a closer look. The Moss Bauer in the center spectrometer, it uses gamma ray particles emitted from cobalt 57 to indicate iron compounds uh, or iron alloys. And the apex analyzes uh, other minerals uh, by using curium 240. 224 that emits x-ray radiations and uh, and helium nuclei to analyze what the uh, what the compound is there it's more of a it's more of a universal the moss bowers aimed at iron the uh, the alpha particle spectrometers uh, for other materials next please a Mars reconnaissance orbiter we took a little bit of a leap and it is the most versatile radio that we've got on Mars to date. It can do everything that the other radios I've mentioned do and more so. This can go, there's a group of frequencies it can operate at instead of just one. It can shift anywhere inside that frequency band. It can either receive or it can transmit and that's what's called a full duplex mode where it's transmitting at, and listening at the same time, transmitting on one frequency and listening on another just like your cell phone does. Or we can flip it into what's called half duplex, where it takes up the entire band if necessary and transmits uh, large amounts of data on that single band. Or it can, and then it would receive large amounts. You trade off lots of bandwidth for uh, slower communications back and forth. But the versatility of this radio, well, part of it was the electronics, which we. Uh, some of it was modifications of the previous radios and some of it was brand new designs. And Jet Propulsion Laboratory designed a uh, better version of, of the digital electronics which controlled everything and it was more versatile. Next please. This is, what's in, this is what has, to me, being an amateur astronomer, is the most interesting part of MRO. It's the, called the high rise. It's a big telescope with a very good CCD imagers on it. It's the largest which this is part of what made the MRO the largest vehicle sent in orbit around Mars. The resolution is close to one meter from close to 220 miles in space. Next. To give you an idea of just how good the cameras are, this picture was taken from Mars orbit 
88 million miles from Earth. You can see the Earth and the Moon. That's how good the imagers are in there. There's a, uh, about 12 CCD imagers in there. Most of them have red filters, but two of the imagers also have blue and green filters. So you combine the red and the blue and the green filters, send the information back to Earth. We do computer processing here, and voila, you've got color pictures. Now we get to Phoenix. Phoenix uh, was a lander that was made out of spare parts from the failed 1999 South Polar Lander, and only this one went to the North Pole. They had picked up the spare parts, assembled it together. Uh, there were some modifications that were done to Phoenix to uh, prevent any mishaps like we suspect might have happened with the 1999 lander and then sent it out in 2008 and landed it in May, Labor Day on 2000, uh, 2008, excuse me, Memorial Day 2008, May, which is, to me, it's been one of the more exciting missions uh, I've been on because I was there for the landing at Green Bank. Next, please. Future. The future involves the Mars Science Laboratory known as Curiosity. This thing's roughly the size of a minivan. It's got one of the most comprehensive suite of instruments available that can be crammed into that size. It's going to be landed almost like a helicopter in what's called a sky crane operation. It's going to have a set of rockets it's going to be mounted to, and once it gets close to the ground, they're going to lower it down to the ground, cut the tether, the rockets fly off and crash somewhere else hopefully not on top. And, the, uh, <clears throat> and this has got a radio, radio isotope power generator, not solar cells on it, and will go off and start working its mission right away. Next. Is there the, some of the instruments that are on?